know what's fun about reading books is that um, I feel like for the really good ones, like every single time I go back to read a chapter, something sticks out to me or you read a book and it feels new every single time you read it. Cause like I'm going through this book again, right? And new things are popping up and then other sections that I had underlined and really thought about, I don't remember exactly why I underlined it, but it spoke to me in that moment. That's the, that's the really cool thing about books is that, um, depending on where you are in life, certain things will stick out to you. And it's just funny because I'm, I'm actually, I was skimming through before recording this morning and I was looking at the different things that I underlined and I was like, oh wow, that's a, that's a deep thought. I don't exactly remember why I, I underlined it there. And then sometimes, and sometimes I underline things that I don't understand quite clearly, but I do know that 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 passage is important to me. I try to write, I don't know about you, but like whenever I'm reading a book, I'll have a pen in hand so that I can underline things. And then I'll also sometimes jot things down like in the margin to help me remember what it was that stood out to me or um, to help me when I'm going back and, and kind of going through a section to kind of remember some of the things that I was getting from the book. Anyways, I find that with certain um, pieces of literature, uh, certain like certain books for me, like speak to me. I think I had the very first experience was with um, obviously the Bible. The Bible has just a lot of amazing um, passages in there that can speak to you. But also Shakespeare. I remember um, I remember being in school and studying Shakespeare, and I remember some passages just speaking to me on like different levels. And it's kind of funny when you have those those experiences with literature. Anyway, I'm not gonna I'm not explaining it well. I know I'm sorry, but I just wanted to kind of start off about that because I'm about to go into chapter one of Falling Upward, which he, which Richard calls the two halves of life. Now, in the introduction, we just went through a very good kind of summary of the first and second half of life. And Richard begins Falling Upward with like a small little introduction into it. And so we're going to go through it, and there's going to be some parts of this chapter that I don't quite get yet, and that's fine. And that's something that is really important whenever we read books. We're not always going to get it. Uh, and Richard speaks in metaphor sometimes, and there are certain things that whenever I read Richard Rohr or Merton or Shakespeare or um, whenever you read any sort of spiritual text or things that are like poetry that can be very, very complex and it speaks to us on different levels. Like sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't. Sometimes it takes you a while to kind of get into it. I feel like that happens with like a good movie too. Sometimes I'll be watching a movie and or a TV show and the story starts like in the middle of something. There is some action taking place, something suspenseful happening. And when you first start watching the movie you're not quite sure what's going on and you're just kind of paying attention trying to take everything in because you're not sure what's important for later that's kind of like reading a good book and certainly the case with reading falling upward there are some things that richard throws out to us early on that we just kind of hold on to because we might not get it until later on and don't worry like What's great about this book is that there are other chapters coming up where he's going to break down kind of um, what is the first half of life or second half of life. And I know that we've just talked about it um, in detail in this first podcast. And now we're going to go into kind of like another 
primer, another kind of intro into the two halves of life, because now we're officially starting the book. And I was just saying how, like, isn't it funny when we skip introductions of books and go right into chapter one? Um, so if you didn't listen to the first podcast where we kind of talked about the introduction, which is fantastic, which really, I think, is a really an amazing um, way to kind of start us and tease us into this first half of life, second half of life. Well, now Richard's going to start and kind of, again, uh, speak to us about these two halves of life and what they kind of mean and giving us a different perspective on it. We're not even a different perspective, just a, okay, let's just, let's just get into this. Okay. So Richard starts by using this quote from Carl Jung. The quote says, one cannot live the afternoon of life according to the program of life's morning, for what was great in the morning will be of little importance in the evening, and what in the morning was true will at evening have become a lie, period. And that's like a really interesting way of thinking about life, about those things that were really important to us in our earlier days those things that we thought were really important. Like don't sometimes we find out that those things really aren't as important as we thought they were. I think that's, this is one of those paragraphs that you just kind of hold on to because it kind of, this is like summarizing. This is kind of it right here. It kind of breaks up the two halves of life. The things that we thought were super important, those structures, those things about ourselves that we thought were really important that kind of defined us later on as you get older. And again, it's not always chronology, but kind of as you move along in life, you soon realize that those things really, really don't define you and aren't all that important anymore. That's kind of the idea here, right? So Richard begins, he says, As I begin to say in the introduction, the task of the first half of life is to create a proper container for one's life and answer the first essential questions. What makes me significant? How can I support myself? And who will go with me? The task of the second half of life is quite simply to find the actual contents that this container was meant to hold and deliver, period. Okay, so you can kind of um, see that now Richard's saying that in the the first kind of half of life, we are asking those questions about like, what makes us who we are? What is our identity? And we said like in the introduction, as we're going through it, like how important those questions are. Those are the things that kind of differentiate us. Those are the things that we think early on, we're trying to just to kind of figure out, like we're coming out with our voice, right? We're coming out with our identity based on where we live, time period, gender, um, kind of things that we do like there's all the different factors right that we talked about and I guess the idea here is that we're we're trying to answer those questions about who we are and that's all we're going to be answering those questions based on kind of our culture where we're living things we've gone through like all those kind of different elements kind of help us to answer those questions and then Richard says this, the task of the second half of life, and he says, is quite simply to find the actual contents that this container was meant to hold. So the first half of life is kind of developing that structure, that identity, that container. Then the second half, Richard is saying, is actually understanding like what are those things really? What is it about ourself that is actually meaningful, that is actually our purpose, our calling, 
our, like who we truly are. And I'm just, I apologize if I'm not explaining this right. I'm still kind of processing through it, but I, that's, you're, you may read this and totally get it. This is kind of how I'm kind of, kind of understanding it. And we'll kind of get through more of this in better detail. And maybe at the end of this podcast, um, and maybe three episodes, four episodes from now, we can actually have a better understanding of what Richard means by the first half building this container, this identity, this structure, and the second half of life about understanding like what all this was really meant to hold. Because right now we're talking about it metaphorically. I think that we'll have a better understanding later on. So let's just move move ahead. Let's continue. Richard says, Various traditions have used many metaphors to make this differentiation clear. Beginners and proficients, novices and initiated, milk and meat, letter and spirit, juniors and seniors, baptized and confirmed, apprentice and master, morning and evening. So Richard's showing like these kind of two stages that a lot of us kind of refer to. And Richard's just talking about first half of life, second half of life in a spiritual context, right? But this idea between kind of two ways of viewing life, beginner, right, advanced, apprentice, master, novice, and initiated, milk and meat. Like those are kind of just the two kind of ways if you were to break life down Uh, you can look at life in that way, right? Richard goes on and says that you cannot do a nonstop flight to the second half of life by reading lots of books about it, including this one, period. I thought that was pretty funny that he's saying that, you know, as we're reading through this, that maybe some of us who are in that first half of life, we just want to, we're reading about this in this book and we're like, oh, how do we just get there? How do we just arrive at the second half of life? Because if it's not about chronology, And it's really about kind of understanding ourselves better and understanding our purpose. Like, how do we get to that point? Because a lot of us ask those questions early in life. You know, what what is it that I was born to do? What is my calling? Like those really deep questions. Like sometimes we just want the answer. We just want to know. But sometimes it takes time to figure that out for us, for ourselves. Okay, so okay, let's move on. Richard goes on to say, no pope. Bible quote, a psychological technique, religious formula, book or guru can do your journey for you. If you try to skip the first journey, you'll never see its real necessity and also its limitations. You'll never know why this first container must fail you. The wonderful fullness of the second half of the journey and the relationship between the two, such as the unreality of many people who never grow up or who remain narcissistic into their old age. I'm afraid this is not a small number of people in our world today, period. So notice that Richard says that the first half of life is a necessity. He calls it a real necessity that also has limitations. And he says also that part of the journey is realizing where that structure, where that container, uh, where those Areas that help to define us early on must fail us. So again, all these little teasers, because when we read this, and I'm and I'm going through this again with you, like there's some things I don't quite get yet, but let's just hold on. Let's keep moving through and um, take the pieces that we do understand with us on this journey through this book. He says that, Juniors on the first part of the journey invariably think that true elders are naive, simplistic, out of it. You know what I mean? Like, that's kind of like a common thing. Like, especially for us when we become teenagers, like, we don't think that the older generation gets us, right? They are trapped in time. Sometimes we feel that people who are older um, just don't get it. They're not with it whatever those terms that you want to use, right? That's kind of, I think, a common thing. Um, Sometimes when we're younger, we think our parents are kind of clueless to what's going on. 
And so that's kind of the mindset of sometimes when you're in that first half of life, I guess, is that you think and treat people who are the elders of society as um, out of touch. When in reality, like they were where you were and have lived and seen things and have come maybe to a new place where they're not out of touch. Um, They're very much there. Um, But sometimes we just don't respect or even talk to those elders about life. And then he says that, and I guess part of it is like that lack of empathy, right? I think that's that's the key part here is that those that are in that first part of life Richard calls them the juniors who are calling elders naive, simplistic, out of it. Like there's a lack of empathy. So Richard goes on and says, conversely, if a person has transcended and included the previous stages, he or she will always have a patient understanding of the juniors and can be patient and helpful to them somewhat naturally, although not without trial and effort. That is precisely what makes such people elders. The key point here, I think, at least for me, is that empathy that is very clear with those who have, I guess, moved on in the second half of life. It's like a true empathy. And in the first half of life, it's kind of missing. Not to say that you can't have empathy in the first half of life, but I think that whenever... um, those feelings of pride are creeping in those feelings that others have nothing to teach us I think that is kind of a sign that we might be in that first half of life which is like Richard says necessary but at some point I think the hope is that we all will move into this stage of empathy and love and compassion where we discover our true selves in the second half. Okay, so now now Richard's going to talk a little bit about first half of life issues. So let's let's go into that. Richard says, almost all of culture and even most of religious history has been invested in the creation and maintenance of first half of life issues. And then he, he goes on and says that the, some of the big concerns are identity, security, and sexuality and gender. Richard says, they don't just preoccupy us. They totally take over. That is where history has been up to now, I'm afraid. In fact, most generations have seen boundary marking and protecting those boundaries as their primary and sometimes only task in life. Most of history has been forging of structures of security and appropriate loyalty symbols to announce and defend one's personal identity, one's group, and one's gender issues and identity. Now we seem to live in a time when more and more people are asking, is that all there is? And I think what's important here is that Richard's just pointing out that there's so much more, that sometimes we get so preoccupied in certain things that are really important to us early in life and should be important to us. The trouble is that when we don't move beyond or look beyond those things, I think that's part of what Richard is getting at here. Because he asked the question, is that all there is? Like there's something else beyond all those really important things, a deeper meaning the task within the task, that there are other things going on here that we need to be concerned about. And sometimes we kind of get stuck on kind of the obvious things. And not to say those those obvious issues of security, identity, our perspective of sexuality and gender, like those are all important, of course, but there's also something else behind all of this that is even more important. That Richard's getting at. Okay, so let's move on. Richard says, so we need boundaries, identity, safety, and some degree of order and consistency to get started personally and culturally. 
We also need to feel special. We need our narcissistic fix. By that I mean we all need some successes, response, and positive feedback early in life, or we will spend the rest of our lives demanding it or bemoaning its lack from others. There is a good and needed narcissism, if you want to call it that. You have to first have an ego structure to then let go of it and move beyond it. Richard says, basically, if you get mirrored well early in life, you do not have to spend the rest of your life looking in narcissist's mirror or begging for the attention of others. You have already been attended to and now feel basically good and always will. If you were properly mirrored when you were young, you are now free to mirror others and see yourself honestly and helpfully, period. Okay, when I read that about the mirroring, that was something that I wanted to learn more about. I wasn't quite sure and actually asked my therapist, like, what does mirroring mean? Because she had talked to me a little bit about the importance of mirroring. Um, And Richard actually has a whole um, section in this book later on where he talks about this idea of mirroring and how important it is uh, for us to mirror the good in others, um, to look for the good in others, to point out the good in others. Because sometimes we don't, sometimes others don't see that in themselves. And part of a good job of being a good friend is pointing out those good things that we see in others. And that's how you can be a really good mirror. Because we can be so critical of ourselves. We see our flaws. We know our mistakes. And some of us can really um, get into a negative mindset by being so focused on our own problems, our own mistakes, our own defects, that um, if we get too caught up in that, it can actually be hard to kind of move along in life. It's hard to even love others when we can't love ourselves. And part of being a good mirror is, and also a good friend, is actually pointing out those great qualities those really good things that we see in others and highlighting it and reminding people um, how how you're seeing goodness in them. And um, and that's just being a good mirror. Anyways, I, I, uh, I never really heard that term mirroring before, so I underlined it and I wanted to learn more about it. And um, Richard definitely gets into it in more detail, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about that here because... When I first heard about this this line where he says, if you were properly mirrored when you were young, you are now free to mirror others and see yourself honestly and helpfully. I think I'm, I'm trying to remember that as I raise my kids. Like, am I properly mirroring them? Am I also using that mirror on them to point out those good things? I think sometimes as parents... We are pointing out those things that need to change, those things they need to fix. And that's a very important role of a parent to raise our kids. But also being a mirror means that we are pointing out those good qualities, those really good things that we want to see them continue to nurture and grow. Same is true of those who are leading teams at work, right? Um, Or anybody who is caring for another person or leading another person like that good mirroring is such a healthy, beautiful thing that we can do for others. And sometimes we're more quick to kind of point out the mistakes, right? Instead of pointing out the goodness. Richard says, when you get your who am I question right, all the what should I do questions tend to take care of themselves. The very fact that so many religious people have so vigorously pro- have to prove and defend their salvation theories makes one seriously doubt whether they've had ever experienced divine mirroring at any great depth, period. Okay, I had to underline that because that was one of those things where I need to read this over and over again. This idea that, man, if we are, we just talked about mirroring others and he said like, Man, if we haven't felt that mirror from God 
what he calls the divine mirror, where we feel that God loves us, that God cares for us. If we haven't received that, accepted that, and sometimes that's really hard to see because, like I said, we're our worst critics. We see our own fallings, our own failings. And sometimes it's hard for us to accept any sort of external love from others or from God. You, you fill in the blank. And Richard's saying, like, if we haven't received that good mirroring, sometimes we're going to end up struggling all through life. And he says this in a spiritual context. He says... The very fact that so many people, so many religious people, have to vigorously prove and defend their salvation theories, he says, makes one seriously doubt whether they have experienced divine mirroring at any great depth. Have they really experienced that true, gracious, all-encompassing love? Have they really felt it? Because you felt it and you realized that you are loved, you are included. And part of our work is now to let other people know that they are loved, that they are included. Okay, in this next section, Richard's going to talk a little bit about um, kind of this breakdown of how when viewing spiritual life or life in general, we, this idea behind these stages, first half of life, second half of life, is not a new concept. So Richard says, it was Carl Jung who first popularized the phrase, the two halves of life, to describe these two major tangents and tasks. Yet many other teachers have recognized that the, these are that there are clear stages and steps of development. This is the foundational journey of Abraham and Sarah, the exodus of Moses, Muhammad's several key flights, Jesus' four kinds of soil, the way of the cross, images on the walls of churches, and then uh, Richard goes on to name a bunch of other examples and people who have talked about various stages of spiritual growth. And then Richard says, they all affirm that growth and development have a direction that are not static. Unless you can chart and encourage both movement and direction, you have no way to name maturity, or immaturity. Most of these teachers, each in his or her own way, seem to coalesce around two key insights that continue to show themselves in almost every one of these constructs. First of all, you can only see and understand the earlier stages from the wider perspective of the later stages. This is why mature societies were meant to be led by elders, seniors, saints, and the initiated. They alone are in a position to be true leaders in a society, or certainly in any spiritual organization. Without them, the blind lead the blind. Sorry. Without them, the blind lead the blind, which is typified by phenomena like violent gangs of youth or suicide bombers. Those who are not true elders or elder sorry, those who are not true leaders or elders will just affirm people at their own immature level. And of course, immature people will love them and elect them for being equally immature. You can fill in the names here with your own political disaster story. But just remember, there is a symbiosis between immature groups and immature leaders. Which is why both Plato and Jefferson said democracy was not really the best form of government. It's just the safest. A truly wise monarch would probably be the most effective at getting things done. Don't send hate letters, please. <laughs> I like um, I like the fact that he's pointing out like the importance of elders in society, um, those who have kind of been there, done that, those who can see the big picture. Man, so much wisdom in those who are older, who have been through struggles and challenges and hardships. Like they have just a, amazing perspective. And again, it's not always chronology, although age does help because you have seen certain things. Um, you have kind of lived life and there's so much wisdom 
And um, this, I mean, reading this just makes me think, man, I, I don't have very many close relationships with older people. When I was younger, I did. Um, but yeah, I need to, I need to really invest more time in those elders, those mentors in society, because um, there's so much to learn. Okay, so now we're going to read a section that is, oh man, this section here, a lot of gold. I guess we were driving in a car. You know, you say, like, put your seatbelt on because we're going for a ride. Like, this is one of those paragraphs, one of those sections that there's a lot here. And we'll try to kind of unpack it right now. But there is so much here. Okay, let's just read it. Richard says, If you have in fact deepened and grown in wisdom, age, and grace, Luke 2.52, you are able to be patient, inclusive, and understanding of all the previous stages. That is what I mean by my frequent use of the phrase, transcend and include. That is the infallible sign that you are enlightened psychologically mature or a truly adult believer period okay so that line transcend and include what a beautiful way to think about how we need to be and i think the idea here is that you are transcending those boundaries that were originally set up like it's not um saying they weren't important you're, move, you're merely moving beyond, above those boundaries. And he says also, the other key word here is include. That you're including everybody else in this journey. He says, The adepts in all religions are always forgiving, compassionate, and radically inclusive. They do not create enemies, and they move beyond the boundaries of their own starter group, while still honoring them, and making use of them. Jesus, the Jew, criticizes his own religion the most, yet never leaves it. Mature people are not either or thinkers, but they bathe in the ocean of both and. Think Gandhi, Anne Frank, Martin Luther King Jr., Mother Teresa, Nelson Mandela, and the like. These enlightened people tend to grease the wheels of religious evolution. As Albert Einstein said, No problem can be solved by the same consciousness that caused it in the first place. God moves humanity and religion forward by the regular appearance of such whole and holy people. Period. Man, I, I, um, all I can do here is just tell you that the thing that I underlined here is the part that says mature people are not either or thinkers, but they bathe in the ocean of both and. That is one of those things that I have to think about a lot. Um, This dualistic mindset that I'm so prone to jump into, that this is either good or bad, way to go. Um, I think that's the default and that, that is extremely helpful in life, right? Nothing wrong with that. And let me shut this window. Like that is the dualistic mindset. That is really important earlier in life. Like that, that's a good guide for figuring out the way to go. But I guess what happens later on is that you realize that a lot of times There isn't just two ways to go. There are rightish ways, leftish ways. Um, I kind of feel like it's this direction or I'm not quite sure what the answer is. And that's okay. Sometimes we don't have the right way to go. Um, And he says that mature people are not either or thinkers. They realize there isn't always just two paths to take. There are often other paths. And sometimes, and Richard gets into this, 
it's sometimes just being comfortable in contradictions, being comfortable that there are sometimes both paths can be helpful to us. Um, both paths that were given or um, seeing beyond those paths and looking for other ways of going about it is kind of, I guess, an enlightened way of, of looking at things. And, and, um, and Richard gives these examples of kind of these rule breakers, Martin Luther King, Mother Teresa, Nelson Mandela, Gandhi, Anne Frank. Um, these are all people who have done and handled things in different ways that have gone um, beyond the norm. This is why we high them. I mean, this is why we, um, this is why we treasure these people. They did things differently. They did things that were unexpected. Richard says, the second insight about steps and stages is that from your own level of development, you can only stretch yourself to comprehend people just a bit beyond yourself. Some theorists say you cannot stretch more than one step above your own level of consciousness, and that is on a good day. Because of the limitations, those at deeper or higher levels beyond you invariably appear wrong, sinful, heretical, dangerous, or even worthy of elimination, period. I think this is the idea that we sometimes, um, when we encounter people like this, and some of these amazing people throughout history, sometimes they're not accepted for their ideas. They have gone contrary to the systems in place. And uh, because society, because certain people can't understand it, that these people are sometimes considered outcasts. And Richard says that part of the problem is that we have difficulty comprehending people that are beyond ourselves. And he says that some theorists say you cannot stretch more than one step beyond or above your own level of consciousness. That's a very interesting idea. That, And one of the reasons why we sometimes just discard uh, people who are have a different mindset or are saying things that are contrary to the rules that we think should be existing. These are the people who are not dualistic, that they're looking for another way to go. And I think the in a business context, we can call this innovation. These are people who are creating things that um, people have not even asked for, but they develop products or solutions that are truly innovative. I mean, they've looked beyond what is in front of them and have found solutions. And I think that that, that works well in a, in a business context. Innovation is a great way to put it. And sometimes innovative thinkers are kind of cast aside early on. They develop something that people will say, why would people need that? Um, and I think an innovator um, is, a, is a really good example of what we're talking about here. People that are looking beyond what's being asked for and coming up with their own um, way of improving something, an idea, a thought, a product, a solution. You can fill in the blank. So, so far, Richard's been talking about you know various stages, moving beyond stages. And then Richard goes on and says... If change and growth are not programmed into your spirituality, if there are not serious warnings about the blinding nature of fear and fanaticism, your religion will always end up worshiping the status quo and protecting your present ego position and personal advantage as if it were God. Although Jesus' first preached message is clearly change, where he told his listeners to repent, which literally means to change your mind, it did not strongly influence Christian history. I think that's a really interesting perspective on Christ's message of repentance. This idea of evolving, of changing, 
necessary change, taking those steps in spiritual maturity, like those are part of the message for all of us is that we need to be growing. Okay, so, so far, Richard's been talking about the importance of viewing spiritual life or just viewing life in general as a series of steps as a series of things where we are growing up into something. And this is all within the chapter of the two halves of life. And, and Richard's basically pointing out that in all these various traditions, we think of life in terms of these seasons, these steps. And so Richard goes on and says, if change and growth are not programmed into your spirituality, if they're not serious warnings about the blinding nature of fear and fanaticism, your religion will always end up worshiping the status quo and protecting your present ego position and personal advantage as if it were God. And I think this is part of the problem. We get sometimes to this point where we think we've arrived. We think we have finally come to the place where we are enlightened and we don't need to move beyond it. We've gotten to the place where we've learned that theological principle, that thing, that rule, whatever it is. And that moment when we think we've arrived, that we finally got it figured out, like that is a problem because part of spiritual growth, part of maturity, part of development as a person means that we should be constantly learning constantly growing and there is no real end point part of maturity means that we're going to continue to evolve continue to change and some of the ideas that we held earlier in life are going to change things that we thought were totally true totally right these could be principles ideas political viewpoints Life happens, things happen, and all of a sudden, our minds begin to shift. We begin to take a different point of view, a slightly different perspective, an innovative idea, right? And that's part of spiritual growth. It's interesting when I look back at some of the things that I believed earlier in life and where I hold and where I'm at now, and 10 years from now, 20 years from now, I could be holding slightly different or different ideas entirely about some of these things. And that's okay. That's part of human maturity, part of human growth. And hopefully, hopefully on this path that we are becoming more loving, more compassionate, more inclusive, like that should be the ultimate goal in how we proceed. So I I really like that. Um, He says, if change and growth are not programmed into your spirituality, if we're not thinking about constant growth, how can I continue to grow? Like then we're running into a problem. Are we, are we growing in our various aspects of our life? Are we becoming more loving? Are we becoming more compassionate? Are we displaying empathy to those around us? And I'm, and I'm speaking very generally here, but let's get specific. Am I becoming a better husband? Am I becoming a better father? Am I becoming a better worker? Working at trying to be compassionate? Like, specifically, like I start to, like zero in on specific situations I'm like man do I have work to do how am I going to be a more loving husband today what are things I need to be doing to display love to my kids more love more care this is where it gets heavy we don't want to remain static we want to keep growing and that means like asking ourselves those questions What are we doing today that are going to make us more loving towards specific people in our lives? So Richard just finished talking about these various stages of life, 
right? And how important it is to be able to evolve, to be able to change, getting comfortable with change. And that can be super, super hard for most of us. In fact, I still have trouble with change, adapting uh, to what's happening right now uh, with COVID-19. So much change happening in the world, so many changes to our routines, changes to how we're working, to how we're living life. Um, It's hard, right? And even more so when it comes to religious thinking, spirituality, when those things change or things happen in our lives that cause us to question how we have practiced or what we've thought about spirituality or God, um, those are very, those are very, very hard times, at least for me. And like Richard's saying, like, it's so important to not be resistant to change, even though that is kind of the norm. Uh, but I like that that line about, he says, yet yeah, even the intelligence of animals is determined by their ability to change and adjust their behavior in response to new circumstances. And I remember um, there was a quote from Pastor Chuck Smith. Uh, I used to attend his church uh, early in life. And one of the things he was known for, for saying was he made up his own proverb, which was, blessed are the flexible for they shall not be broken. And I love that. I think that is such a true statement. Being flexible during really hard times, adapting, like that is really, it's really important to be able to do those things, but it's really hard in the moment, right? Super, super hard to adapt sometimes, especially when it comes to our own spiritual thinking about things. And because our thinking is going to change, it's going to evolve as life happens to us. And we're all headed. Um, we all have various different circumstances that we go through, which are going to, which is going to alter our perception of our thinking about God, our thinking about life, depending on how easy or how hard uh, life is for us. Okay, so this next section, it's called Of God and Religion. And there's a lot of metaphor here and a lot of things that I'm not quite sure how to respond. So I'm just going to read some of these passages to you that speak to me. And I'm not, I might not have anything, anything to say about them because I'm still kind of processing it, but I think they're important words. So I want to read them. Richard says, theologically and objectively speaking, We are already in union with God, but it is very hard for people to believe or experience this when they have no positive sense of identity, little courage yet, no strong boundaries to contain mystery, and little inner religious experience at any depth, period. What a a beautiful, inclusive idea here that he says that we are already in union with God. We are already one with him. Richard continues and says, thus the first journey is always about externals, formulas, superficial emotions, flags and badges, correct rituals, Bible quotes, and special clothing, all of which largely substitute for actual spirituality, period. That is super true for me. I remember, and I think that this is so true for a lot of us, when you first start to join a church and start to begin learn to learn like the practices, the things that you do, right, to observe your particular religion, the, the prayers, the, uh, the time to go to church, the day of the week, the, um, the other things that are set up for you, the books to be reading, the Bible studies to be going to. And those, I think those things are all well and good. The trouble is when we begin to make those things as the reasons why we are, quote, saved 
the reasons why we are spiritually better than others because that's compl- right that's not the right mindset uh the, the whole point of it really is to help us become more loving more accepting more inclusive uh, not in any way to make us look better or to think that we're better because we do these spiritual x y and z things but i think earlier on in life like you're just doing what you're told you're doing these things and you think that, well, if I do these things, I'm doing these um, external things, then somehow I am connecting more with God. And like Richard says, like actually you've been in union with him the whole time. And if we can just kind of accept that, like, man, what a, what a beautiful, beautiful thought. And I know that There's a lot of metaphor here, but I think just this idea like, hey, you are already in union with God. Like, what does that mean to you? What does that mean to me? Like, from the very start, like you are loved and there is no need to be thinking that you had to be doing all these other things to make your union better. It's a beautiful thought. Richard goes on and says, yet they are all used and needed to create the container. Yes, it is largely style and sentiment instead of real substance, but even that is probably necessary. Just don't give your life for mere style and sentiment. Pope John's motto might be heard here, in essentials, unity in non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity. That is second half of life, hard-won wisdom, period. So Richard's saying, like, all those things, those external things that maybe we have participated in or done and were misled by thinking that those things somehow made us more in union with God, he said those things, those those practices, the style, the sentiment. He says those things were all part of the journey, right? And then I think that that closing statement from Pope John about in essentials unity, in non-essentials liberty, and in all things charity, that gets to the heart of everything here. That in all things, it comes down to love and once we've really thought about this idea that we are loved, that we are already in union, like what joy that can bring us and what that joy can do for how we live our lives, how we treat others, how we love ourselves by really realizing like how much we are loved. Such a it's such a deep thought and beautiful thought and something that I need to be thinking more about. Like already in union. We are already in union with God. Richard goes on and says, In the first half of our lives, we have no container for such awesome content. No wineskins that are prepared to hold such utterly intoxicating wine. You see... Authentic God experience always burns you, yet does not destroy you. Exodus 3, verse 2 and 3. Just as the burning bush did to Moses. But most of us are not prepared for such burning, nor even told to expect it. The Islamic mystics seem to be the most honest here, as we see the ecstatic and erotic poetry of Rumi, Kabir, and Hafiz. By definition, authentic God experience is always too much. It consoles our true self only after it has devastated our false self. We must begin to be honest about this instead of dishing out fast food religion. This statement about authentic God experience always burns you, yet does not destroy you. What does that mean to you? (laughs) That here, I think, Richard's 
getting at that part of our our journey, part of our experience with God is that there is going to be these moments where we are burned, where uh, we are going to be going through some very hard times, yet we're not going to be destroyed by that burning. And he says that most of us are not prepared for such burning. And I totally, totally agree with that. I mean, who of us? I don't know. Some people might be prepared for it. I certainly was not prepared for some of these very difficult moments I've had. Um, And knowing that God was there the whole time, that we are in union with God the entire time, and then to be having to go through some traumatic events. Now, in my personal journey, in some of these moments, I felt so far away from God, even questioning whether God was even real uh, because of some of the things I've gone through. And you may have felt the same way. Maybe you currently feel that way. You look at some of the evil going on in the world, some of the trauma happening, and you're like, how could there be a God that allows that, right? Totally, totally understand that concept. Totally understand that idea. I was there. And the idea that how can we be prepared for some of this burning, for some of this pain? I I don't think any of us are ever prepared for it. It just happens to us and then we have to deal with it. And during those moments of the burning, those those traumatic, painful moments, the idea that we're in union with God um, sometimes doesn't really make any sense to us that God is actually there with us in the burning. It's a very, very hard idea here. It's just, I guess this is just part of life, right? Whatever you want to call it, we're going to have difficult times and some of them are going to be very, very hard. But if we know that God is there with us even during those difficult times. It can give us, it can give us hope. It can give us encouragement. Not all the time, but I would hope that it would. I hope that next time I go through a burning, a difficult period, that I can remember that God is there with me, that I'm in union with God. I hope I I hope I feel that way. Richard goes on and says. Early stage religion is largely preparing you for the immense gift of this burning. He calls it a gift. He says, this inner experience of God as though creating a proper stable into which the Christ can be born. Unfortunately, most people get so preoccupied with their stable and whether their stable is better than your stable or whether their stable is the only one holy Catholic and apostolic stable that they never get to the birth of God in their soul, period. Okay, so here, here's the part that, that got me. He said, unfortunately, most people get so preoccupied with their stable, their framework, their religion, their identity, whatever that is, is better than your stable, Right? When we start to compare and so we get to think that the way we've, we've got it figured out, everyone else got it wrong, all the other religions, all the other, um, or whatever. You don't have to, it doesn't have to be religion. It could be whatever you want, fill in the blank. Um, we've got it figured out. Other people don't. And he said, and then what he says about or whether they're stable is the one holy Catholic and apostolic stable. <laughs> That he says, like, when we get so, and this is like that judgmental thinking, that um, that thinking that we've got it all figured out. And again, that's kind of rooted in a pride, I think. And I think that this is normal. I think that, of course, we want to think that we've got things figured out. We don't want to be, um, I mean, a lot of us have spent some time in researching and deciding the things that we want to believe about certain things. And of course we want to think that we're right, 
right? And other people don't, that don't believe our way are wrong. In some cases, when we're being ex- exclusive, there are definitely um, moments where we can be unloving. And, and Richard's saying here, he says, they never get to the birth of God in the soul. Like that, that birth of love, essentially. It's that um, exclusive attitude that can just reduce the ability to love. And I could totally be misreading this. I am sorry. (laughs) But this is how it speaks to me. Okay, Richard continues and says, As a priest of 40 years, I find that much of the spiritual and pastoral work of churches is often ineffective at the levels of real transformation and calls forth immense passivity and even many passive aggressive responses. He goes on and says, as a spiritual director, I find that most people facing the most important transformative issues of social injustice, divorce, failure, gender identity, and inner life of prayer or any radical reading of the gospel are usually bored and limited by the typical Sunday church agenda, period. To me, the best critics are those who are able to be critical of their own system. They see the flaws in their own organization. We need those people at our companies. We need those people in our churches. We need critics. They help stay, they help us stay on balance. They help us, critics help us to pay attention to areas where we might be getting off path And I I really appreciate Richard being a critic of his own church, being a critic of how many churches operate and not touching on those really, really important issues that are sometimes those issues that cause us to struggle so much. I mean, he calls it out here. Social injustice, divorce, failure, gender identity, these things that can rock us to our core. Those things that, those subjects that we oftentimes don't hear them from the pulpit. We just end up dealing with them on our own. Or sometimes we have a support group that we can chat to. But a lot of times when we first encounter these issues, we don't have anyone to go to. We're kind of struggling on our own with these things, especially some of those deep failings. We're even too ashamed to even talk about them. And so, and if you don't have the church addressing them, you don't have anyone that you can talk to. That's a huge problem. Richard goes on and says, of course, clergy can't even talk about the further journey if they have not gone in, gone on it themselves, period. And this is just a critique of, I mean, many of us. I mean, you think I think about any sort of leader, parent, teacher. If you've never had to deal with severe trauma, pain, uh, deep challenges, um, and then those types of things often can push us into this, you know, second half of life type of thinking, then it's hard to even, I mean, how is someone like that supposed to be able to communicate on those really, really hard topics if they haven't gone through it themselves, right? It's not their fault. They're just, they haven't been exposed to it. And, and so it's hard. And I, I think for me, one of the things that I have found is that from going through hard times, it has built up in me a lot of empathy for those who have had similar struggles. Like I can totally connect. And even though the struggle may not be exactly the same, I can feel the pain when I hear someone talk about things that maybe I have a slight understanding of because I've dealt with something similar. And, and, and you know, the hard thing about trauma 
and listening to someone talk about what they're going through is that we sometimes feel very, um, um, it's hard for us to connect sometimes because we realized from hearing their pain that I've gone through pain too, but is a different kind of pain. And I want to relate to you, but I also don't want to be uncaring because I don't even want to pretend that my pain is anyone anywhere near or like your pain because we all experience trauma and difficulty differently and our pain is going to be experienced differently. But I think that what's important is that we are there for those individuals, that we can just listen and be able to at least relate on a human level of what pain is like and being able to be a comfort for that person in how in whatever way we possibly can as we figure out what needs they have and i think that's part of the the beauty that can come out of the difficult situations is that we have grown into individuals who have more love more empathy more sympathy and are looking for ways to help those individuals because we realized maybe during our time of difficulty that no one was there for us nobody could understand us and we felt very much alone and it's only those who have kind of right experienced it that have that unique ability to be able to connect and be able to sit alongside that person and be like, you know what? I want to listen. I want to hear your story. I can share with you my story later on, but I want to let you know that you're cared for. And I want to understand more of what you're going through. No judgment. But it's super hard for those who have not gone through those situations like Richard's saying here that clergy can't talk about this further journey they can't talk about deep trauma if they have not gone through it themselves and so for those of us who have and as you encounter people who are having difficulty that you can connect with please please be that person who sits with them and has empathy and be love for that person, be Christ for that person. Okay, Richard ends this chapter by saying, In short, we have not found a way to do the age-appropriate tasks of the two halves of life, and both groups are losing out. The juniors are made to think that the container is all there is, and all they should expect, or worse, that they are mature and home-free, because they believe a few right things or perform some right rituals. Period. This, this is totally me. Like growing up, I totally felt and believed that if I just did certain things, did certain practices, said certain prayers, attended church on Sundays and Wednesdays, participated in different prayer groups, like I felt like by doing all those things that somehow, and even though I, know I would never say it at the time, I would never say that those things saved me those things all became part of my salvation project that I felt by doing all those things, I somehow was becoming more accepted, more loved. And this isn't the fault of the church. The church wasn't teaching that, but that's what I understood. This is what I saw others doing. And I felt like I needed to be doing those things too. And somehow by doing X, Y, and Z, I was now, in better union, more accepted, more loved. And the trouble, right, is that the moment you stop doing those things, you now automatically feel disconnected, no longer in union, no longer loved. That's the problem. That is a huge problem. But that's where I was. That's where I totally was. So I totally connect with what Richard's saying here. Then he goes on and says, the would-be maturing believer is not challenged to any adult faith or service to the world, much less mystical union. Everyone ends up 
in a muddled middle where the best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity, as William Butler Yeats puts it. So what's interesting is Richard's saying that like if someone continues in this thinking that if they do X, Y, and Z to be saved and that just continues throughout life and you're just focused on those things, those external things that help you feel closer to God, then Richard is saying that at some point you may never be challenged to any sort of adult faith or mystical union or service to the world because you're, you get so caught up in doing your projects, your salvation project, your spiritual tasks that, and what's weird is that you would think that, oh, well, by doing these spiritual tasks, you will grow in better union, that you'll have these mystical experiences or these moments of um, spiritual insights from God, you would think that that would be the case. But Richard's saying, no, actually, that's not what ends up happening. He says, uh, he says, in fact, the would-be maturing believer is not challenged to any adult faith or service to the world, much less mystical union. I thought it was interesting he talks about service to the world. And I think maybe that could be that you get so caught up in doing your things that you stop caring for others and helping the world around us and helping those around us because we're so focused on our own self and our own projects. It's a hard, hard lesson here. It's, yeah, a lot, obviously a lot here. This is why this book is so great, right? I mean, I feel like sometimes you, like every sentence in a paragraph, you just want to sit and think about, and I struggle with them. Sometimes I don't know what I think about it. And sometimes I don't completely agree. But then later on by reading through and, and getting a sense of everything Richard was saying, I can go back to it and go like, okay, I get it. I get it now. And then sometimes I don't get it. Sometimes sometimes I'm just questioning because I just, I don't quite, I don't grasp all of it. And that's the thing with beautiful literature. That's the thing with beautiful poetry is that it can speak to us on so many levels. And then sometimes we only take pieces of it that speak to us in our moment. And then maybe, on, maybe later on in life when we come back to it, we can look at those words again and it can speak to us in a totally different way. Or there's portions of it that we totally connect with now that we totally didn't understand earlier in life. And that's that's the beautiful thing about the reason why I love this book so much. Richard ends this chapter by saying, I'm convinced that much of this pastoral and practical confusion has emerged because we have not clarified the real differences, the needs, and the somewhat conflicting challenges of the two halves of our own lives. So let's try. I think what... Richard has been doing here is just giving us the building blocks, giving us the awareness of these two halves of life and some of the challenges and struggles with the first half of life and staying in first half of life mindsets. He's just, he's just pointing it out. And like I said before, I read this book. I never, I never thought of life in this way. I certainly think of life in stages, but I never really thought about it in, okay, let's group life into two stages and that some people will stay in stage one, first half of life thinking. And and what's interesting about all this is that as, as Richard's pointing out the challenges, he's also showing the necessity too of it, Right. Like all throughout this chapter, he's talking about first half of life is necessary and important for building your boundaries, for building your structure. Like that's very, very important, what you're just saying. But then at some point, we need to move beyond it. And that idea of moving beyond it is where we're headed next in this book. Um, So... Richard is just setting us up here. 
he's just pointing out that this first half of life is essential, it's necessary, we need structure, we need boundaries, we need to kind of know um, where and who we are in our place and time. But then that's just the first part of it. So for me, when I was first reading this, I'm like, oh, this is exciting. Like, this is super exciting. I think sometimes we think that, oh, we're just when Richard's pointing out all these like problems with first half of life thinking, we start to just like kind of demonize it. And if you, if we, as you've been seeing, Richard has been talking about how necessary and important first half of life is. That structure is so important. And now, now he's going to talk about how do we then kind of move beyond? What does that look like? And before we before he gets into it, Richard's chapter two is called The Hero and the Heroine's Journey. Did I say that right? Heroine's Journey? Um, where Richard is going to talk a little bit about first half of life, second half of life through the lens of the Odyssey which is that Greek classic poem, um, the story of Odysseus. And Richard's going to talk about that story in light of first half of life, second half of life. And I remember when I first approached it, I thought, oh, this is interesting. He's bringing up a Greek classic tale. It's a, it's a weird you know, idea to bring into a, to do a whole chapter on that in a book about um, spirituality. But um, I think that it's, uh, it's a really good structure for where Richard's headed. And so when we come back in the next episode, we'll look at chapter two, the hero and the heroine's journey, the heroine's journey. I'm totally saying that wrong. That's okay. <laughs> let's, uh, let's chat in chapter two. Take care.